Okay, here we are, Sunday afternoon, about 1.30 in the afternoon, in Berkeley, California. We're at 65th Street and Telegraph Avenue, uh, and we're going in to check out uh, somebody I heard on KPFA, I think his name is Dr. Horn, who's making a lot of sense. So I thought I'd create a little media. Here's the venue over here, the Nebel Proctor Library. In about a half hour, I believe his name is Dr. Horn, a history professor at the University of Houston in Texas. He's going to be giving a talk. And, uh, I'd like to uh, put out some media and uh, because he was making a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, when I heard him on KBFA talking about the history of Hawaii and the labor movement there and the United States labor movement it was making a whole lot of sense. Got a good opportunity right here. Good afternoon and welcome to what I hope will be the first of many Sunday afternoon forums bringing in here uh, scholars the likes of uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, who's the Moore Professor of the Moore's Professor of Afro-American Studies and History at the University of Houston, and he's currently doing residence at um, University of North Carolina. Well, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been here before. And let me say that with regard to these first two books that Gary mentioned, The White Pacific and Fighting in Paragraph, Fighting in Paradise, they had their origins in the San Francisco Bay Area. A few years ago, I was doing research out of this wonderful library that I hope you all are familiar with that's at the Presidio in San Francisco. It's a very fantastic maritime library, very amply stocked. And I was working on a book that eventuated in the title Red Seas, uh, Ferdinand Smith and Radical Black Sailors in the United States and Jamaica, and it's about the National Maritime Union, which in some ways is a companion union of the Bay Area's own International Longshore and Warehouseman's Union, which is, you know, is headquartered in San Francisco. And it was there that I stumbled across something that theretofore I was not familiar with, which was this process known as blackbirding. Blackbirding, for those of you who may not be familiar, was what happened not least after the U.S. Civil War, that is to say 1865 going forward, when, as Gary noted, you had many of the sons of the Confederacy, those who had tried to overthrow the United States government in 1861 in order to preserve and perpetuate slavery. And then after losing that conflict, they basically had something of a diaspora. Uh, in my book, The Deepest South, the United States, Brazil, and the African Slave Trade, I talk about how many of them moved to Brazil, where slavery is not abolished until 1888. In fact, takes some of their, quote, Africans <coughs> with them, quote, which means that uh, those we now refer to as African Americans uh, probably have relatives in Brazil they may not be familiar with. But as well, many of these Confederates migrated to the South Seas, where they basically engaged in this process known as blackbirding, where those who are defined as Melanesians, that is to say those who are as dark-skinned as myself, and perhaps could easily be mistaken for Africans, were basically kidnapped and taken as bonded laborers to Fiji in the South Seas and to Queensland, Australia, principally to work on sugar plantations. And the same holds true, or held true, I should say, 
for Polynesians, you know, the indigenous people of Tahiti and places of that sort. And what happens is that the Kingdom of Hawaii, which was an independent, diplomatically recognized state with diplomatic relations in Washington, in London, all over the world, Japan, basically tries to intervene to halt this odious traffic. And for their pains and troubles, <laughs> a tiny minority of, quote, white Americans, unquote, uh, overthrow the Kingdom of Hawaii. And then a few years later, this is in the 1890s, and then a few years later, Hawaii is annexed as a colony. And then to fast forward to the end of the second book, uh, Fighting in Paradise, Hawaii, as you know, then becomes a state the 50th and presumably <laughs> final state in this country now known as the United States of America, which may have a different name uh, at some point, perhaps in the 20th century. But in any case, after the overthrow of the Hawaii Kingdom and the annexation of Hawaii as a colony by the United States, uh, you had an acceleration of a very vile form of labor exploitation, uh, principally centered on sugar and pineapple plantations, but also to a degree encompassing the docks. Uh, by some estimates, uh, Hawaii is the most physically isolated piece of territory on this small planet. It's closer to Osaka, Japan, than it is to Boston, for example. And there hangs another tale, because before being overthrown, the Hawaii Kingdom, which recognized what was coming down the pipe, was trying to effectuate something of a diplomatic alliance with the rising state of Japan as a hedge against being overthrown by the United States. And a, an agreement was worked out where many Japanese migrated to the islands. And even today, in 2011, the plurality of the population of Hawaii is of Japanese ancestry. And they became a, a major target of labor exploitation, since they were a disproportionate percentage of the working class. And B, uh, I would say, disproportionately became involved in the activism, which we'll talk about momentarily. In any case, from the 1890s to the mid-1930s, you, you have basically established a form of apartheid in the Hawaiian Islands with a tiny white minority larding it over this uh, large and sprawling Asian Pacific uh, population. And there are many attempts during that period from the 1890s to the 1930s to organize and to do something about this. <coughs> But oftentimes, the organizing runs aground uh, on the rocks and on the shoals of ethnic and racial divisions. I should also mention that in the White Pacific, I talk about an effort by the white overlords of Hawaii in the 1890s, late 1890s, after they had seized power to, to bring some US Negroes from Tennessee uh, to the islands. That didn't work out very well for various reasons. But they also brought Puerto Ricans as well. To, to the islands, many of whom, whose descendants are, are still there. Uh, Hawaii, as you know, has a, a wonderfully diverse population. But in any case, that kind of diversity, oftentimes in a jiu-jitsu maneuver, was turned back against the working class in terms of making it difficult to come together in class-based alliances with ethnic and racial divisions being played upon. Uh, which leads to a rather unfortunate and sad standard of living. Uh, even today, in 2011, you still have many people who are homeless, and there were even more in the, in the run-up to the arrival in Honolulu in the mid-1930s of the ILWQ organizers. People sleeping on beaches, for example, people sleeping in shacks with inadequate plumbing, uh, no running water, uh, malnourishment stalks the land. 
Uh, these were the kinds of conditions that obtained uh, in the run-up to the mid-1930s when the ILWU, headquartered in San Francisco, uh, which is a fact I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, led by Harry Bridges, uh, dispatches organizers to organize uh, Honolulu. The organizers arrive in Honolulu in the mid-1930s, and they're well on their way to organizing the docks in the first place. Uh, Honolulu, excuse me, Hawaii at that time has a population of probably no more than about a half million. Uh, even today, the population is only about 1.2, 1.3 million. And uh, the archipelago is heavily dependent on imports everything from toilet paper to cars. And so therefore, the dockers are strategically important. And it was uh, maximally important that they were organized by the ILWU. But what happens is that, as you well know, December 7, 1941, World War II intervenes. So that's the day, as Roosevelt say, that will forever live in infamy, in which uh, Japanese bomber planes bomb Pearl Harbor. Uh, launching the Pacific War, launching the United States into World War II. And that, in a sense, interrupts labor organizing. It interrupts labor organizing for a number of reasons. Number one, as noted, a disproportionate percentage of the working class in Hawaii was of Japanese ancestry. And as you know, once the United States became embroiled in World War II, uh, there was discriminatory targeting of the population of Japanese ancestry, not only in this region, the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, but in the region not only stretching from Seattle to San Diego on the west coast of the United States, but I think it's fair to say in the region, region stretching from uh, Vancouver and Victoria and what is now British Columbia all the way down to Peru, uh, you had a special targeting of the population of Japanese ancestry. And as you know, in the West Coast, uh, they were dispossessed. The West Coast of the United States, they were dispossessed. Uh, many of them were interned. Many of them moved inland because of the alleged national security threat that they posed. And I'm sure you're asking yourselves at this point, well, what happened to the Japanese, the population of Japanese ancestry in the archipelago? Well, what happens in some ways, it's better, and in some ways, it's worse. Uh, first of all, the former. Because the economy of Hawaii is so dependent upon Japanese labor, I mean, they're driving the buses, they're driving the taxis, they're doing the barbering, they're on the docks, they're delivering the milk. <coughs> if the population of Japanese ancestry had been all interned, uh, there would have been a shutdown of the archipelago. And at that time, uh, Hawaii was well on its way to being what it is now, something of a Gibraltar of the Pacific. Uh, by some estimates in 2011, it's one of the most militarized sites on this small planet. This is where the Pacific Command of the US military is sited. Uh, the United States uh, National Security uh, Mafia, if I can use that term, had come to the conclusion that uh, Hawaii, who controls Hawaii is important to who controls the United States, which is one of the reasons for the <coughs> annexation in the 1890s. And therefore, interning the entire working class would have been counterproductive, it was thought. I should say the entire, the, the working classes of Japanese ancestry, which was a disproportionate percentage of the working class, would have been uh, counterproductive to U.S. national security. But on the other hand, uh, it is fair to say that there was a form of martial law that was established in Honolulu during the course of the conflict in the Hawaiian Islands during the course of the war. Uh, you had uh, stevedores of Japanese origin who were marched off the docks at the point of a bayonet because of their labor organizing. Uh, by some estimates, there was a form of fascism that existed in Hawaii during the course of the war. Uh, in some ways, 
more severe than what has befallen any other site under the U.S. flag, perhaps other than the Deep South of Mississippi, Alabama, during the bad old days of Jim Crow. Uh, obviously, this put uh, uh, placed a hindrance upon labor organizing, and it also put a hindrance on the operations of the Communist Party as well. And there is a story that I tell in the book about the contested opinions uh, within the left itself about the civil liberties violations that befell the population of Japanese origin, and perhaps we could go into that in more detail. In any case, the interruption, if you like, of World War II was simply that in terms of the surge of the left, of the Communist Party, of the ILWU, uh, which quickly uh, picks up the baton after the conclusion of World War II in 1945 you have a whirlwind of labor organizing that sweeps through the archipelago beginning with the conclusion of World War II to the point where in a scant 12 months following VJ Day or Victory Over Japan Day, September 1, 1945, you have a substantial percentage of the working class of Honolulu, excuse me, of Hawaii that's organized under the leadership of the ILWU a union which is not hostile to the Communist Party, to put it mildly. They engage in a number of militant labor actions, uh, a very enormously successful sugar strike, a strike on the sugar plantation. And I might say in the book uh, Fighting in Paradise that I talk at some length about how they organize that strike and how they organize their strikers. And I think that that narrative about that will be useful in the future to those of you who may be interested in organizing your own strikes, uh, perhaps even here in this lovely San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I also talk about a less successful pineapple strike. And I think that there are some lessons there, too, to be gleaned, because sometimes we can learn more from our failures than from our victories, uh, surprisingly enough. Needless to say, the fact that you have the ILWU basically advancing an influence in Hawaii, an archipelago that is seen as important as to the national security of the United States of America, as evidenced by December 7, 1941, this is attracting the fevered attention of certain analysts and policymakers in Washington, D.C. Indeed, it's difficult to separate the rising red scare that engulfs the United States after World War II, it's difficult to separate that from what's happening in the islands because, as I will try to articulate, the left and labor were probably stronger in Hawaii than anywhere else under the U.S. flag. By, by far, there's hardly a comparison to be made. Uh, this kind of fever hysteria reaches a zenith in 1949 when the stevedore is going strike. You may think of a stevedore or longshore strike in Hawaii as something that's only affecting the archipelago itself. But a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And the Hawaiian islands were chained in turn to the United States. And many products that were sold in uh, Hawaii were manufactured in the United States, so obviously this is affecting the economy of the United States when the Hawaiian Islands are shut down. And in turn, there are exports from Hawaii that are going to the mainland. So this 1949 stevedore strike, which lasts for months on end, uh, attracts quite a bit of attention in the mainland press, which leads directly to what becomes uh, an, an annual show. That is to say, congressional investigators decamping to Honolulu, preferably during the winter months, uh, December, January, February, for investigations of so-called communist infiltration of Hawaii. This becomes a, a regular event. But uh, what these legislators quickly find is that it's very difficult to turn the working class 
against the Communist Party and the ILWU because the working class had identified the rise in their wages, the betterment of their working conditions with the arrival of, on their shores of the ILWU and the Communist Party. And in turn, they associated anti-communism with the apartheid overlords. This discussion about Hawaii and the alleged communist infiltration gets caught, caught up in another discussion, which is whether or not Hawaii should become a state. It's interesting to note that beginning in the 1930s, the left and the Communist Party had this idea that a la the Philippines, which comes under US jurisdiction about the same time that Hawaii does, uh, that Hawaii is a classic case of self-determination that should call for independence and sovereignty of the Hawaiian Islands, particularly given the coup d'etat, the illegal means, the improper, odious means by which Hawaii came under US jurisdiction in the first place. Beginning in the 1930s, there was this idea, however, that the apartheid overlords had uh, that Hawaii should become a state. And Hawaii was sort of proceeding rather nicely on that path to becoming a state. But then you have the intervention, if you like, of the ILWU and the Communist Party, and now second thoughts begin. The idea is, according to the apartheid overlords, that if Hawaii becomes a state, and if there is universal suffrage, suffrage then the Kremlin will be selecting two US senators, which would be a threat to US national security. That is to say, the Communist Party has so much influence, and they're controlled by the Kremlin, and therefore the Kremlin will be selecting two US senators, not to mention one or two members of the US House, House of Representatives, and that's completely unacceptable and intolerable. Uh, then the other idea that quickly gains currency, particularly amongst the Dixiecrats, who are uh, disproportionately represented in the legislators from Washington who are coming to investigate so-called communist infiltration, the idea that they're putting forward is that it's totally intolerable for Hawaii to become a state uh, because that will lead to so-called non-whites being elected to the U.S. Senate, and this was also seen as insufferable and, and intolerable. But not only that, but then they probably vote in favor of civil rights legislation, which actually turned out to be true, and that too was seen as insufferable and intolerable. But in any case, uh, the left pushes aggressively uh, for statehood, and the apartheid overlords, who were originally war, war for statehood, begin to sort of backtrack about statehood. And I think because the apartheid o overlords have second thoughts about statehood, the left it seems there's sort of auto, autopilot politics. If the apartheid overlords are backtracking, then we should move forward uh, on statehood. It's, but, and, and of course, the left is under a certain amount of pressure, too. When you're under pressure, as you, I'm sure you know, it's oftentimes difficult to think clearly and to think straight. In any case, these investigations accelerate, anti communist investigations accelerate in the 1950s leading to a Smith Act trial. You recall the bad old days of the Smith Act, these anti-communist prosecutions that took place in San Francisco, New York, all over the country, where uh, left labor and communist party leaders were put on trial, allegedly for advocating the uh, forceful, forcible overthrow of the US government. Basically, it's a way to illegalize uh, promulgating doctrines of class struggle, something we're still suffering under, I would say, in the United States of America. Uh, that helps to shed light upon why we're having such difficulty gaining traction in the midst of an incipient uh, depression that already is called the Great Recession. What's striking about Honolulu, where the Smith Act trial takes place, is that when the indictments are enunciated, you have thousands of workers who go on strike. Now, with all due respect to the activism on the mainland, Nothing of that character or, or type happened on the mainland in response to Smith Act trials. You have labor activism that accelerates. As a matter of fact, the ILWU, I, I, I recall one of the leaders saying, you know, we're going to make them pay for putting the Communist Party and the ILW leadership on trial. And they did. You know, they hiked their wage demands, et cetera. There was all sorts of activism, slowdown, strikes on the plantations and on the docks, et cetera. So to the point where, uh, even though there were convictions, none of them really ever served uh, time, at least not you know, maybe a day or two in jail. 
after the conviction, but, but not the kind of time that you saw on the mainland, where you know, Communist Party leaders served lengthy jail terms. Some of them went underground, others driven in exile in Mexico and elsewhere, etc. Well, you didn't have that in Honolulu. So there's all this activism that's taking place throughout the 1950s that helps to account for an amazing expansion of rights and wage increases. Even today, Hawaii is the bluest of the blue states, to use contemporary US lingo. The Republicans that get elected in Hawaii, or as they say in Washington, rhinos, Republican in name only, like former Governor Linda Lingo, who was really Democratic Party light. The kind of uh, rock-ribbed, hard-nosed conservatism that seems to have such a following on the mainland uh, basically has little purchase in, in the uh, archipelago. And so as a result, uh, Hawaii has done a better job of extending health care to a significant percentage of its citizenry uh, in a way that Washington has only sporadically attempted. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment gained more, this is the, amendment, the proposed amendment to the US Constitution to guarantee equal rights for women. It got more traction in, in Hawaii than it got on the mainland. Uh, protecting uh, reproductive uh, freedoms of women has gained more traction in the archipelago than it has on the mainland. Uh, marriage equality, ditto. Uh, protection of agricultural workers, something that you're still struggling with in the state of California, as I understand despite the election of Jerry Brown, Oakland's own, who we are told has a special place in his heart for the United Farm Workers. Uh, still, you're struggling with extending benefits to farm workers, something that was accomplished long ago in the archipelago. And this is largely attributable, attributable I would say, to the strong left radical Communist Party movement and the ILWU. And even though I would argue that the left had to retreat to a degree from the 1950s to 2011. Had to retreat, I would say, from Communist Party influence to, say, liberal Democrat, social Democrat influence. But still, you know, for the United States, that's fantastic. <laughs> that you probably know. If you're familiar with Texas, you'll you know that that sounds otherworldly. Um, and they still maintain that left-leaning tradition. But I do think that part of the fevered right-wing hysteria that has gripped this country since November 2008 is due in no small part not only to this reality of a president of African ancestry, Kenyan ancestry, more precisely. But also, I think that there's sort of a repressed memory syndrome in operation, where in the deepest, darkest recesses of the consciousness of the right wing, there's this repressed memory of this Hawaii that had a strong Communist Party, strong union movement that pushed back aggressively and strongly against the apartheid overlords the close cousins of the Dixiecrats, that basically had pinned to the map the right wing in a way uh, that rarely occurs under the US flag. And uh, as a result of this repressed memory, they're sort of thinking that maybe they're reliving the dream, or the nightmare, I should say, of Hawaii circa 1952. And that once again, the right wing will be pushed back aggressively by the Communist Party, by a strong labor movement, by a strong left wing, bringing social benefits, preserving social security, hiking unemployment compensation benefits, extending universal health care, all of the elements of a right wing nightmare and a progressive dream. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>